Thank you very much. And, you know, after that uh, introduction, you can be sure that you are safe as far as, you know, you don't have to worry about assassinations or anything. Um, uh, but, um, you know, I, I appreciate the, uh, the gracious uh, introduction here. But, you know, hemophilia is a, is a condition that I think many of you may have seen in, you know, the hospital, maybe even in your clinics. Uh, it's not common, but we have a hemophilia treatment center here. We have uh, close to 200 patients between us and the pediatric uh, hematology group. And so at some point, if you haven't seen a hemophilia patient, you probably will. And what I'm going to, to endeavor to do in the, in the next hour is, is to really give you all sort of an understanding of what this condition really is and where things are right now in terms of management. And in doing so, we'll kind of put things in historical perspective because as, as Dr. Lederer just said, that, that the history of hemophilia and its, uh, uh, its treatment has a lot of intrigue, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of bumps on the road. And I think you will appreciate where we are once you put that in context with, with where we have been uh, with hemophilia. So let's just start with that. Here's my disclosures. They're also in the in the in the uh, flyer. So, what exactly is hemophilia? Now, most of us understand it as a condition that is associated with excessive bleeding, right? But this has actually been known for a very long time. Since ancient times, there have been, you know, manuscripts and and various things that have been written describing a bleeding disorder that looks very much like hemophilia. It's been in the, in the Talmud, the Jewish rabbinical uh, writings in the second century AD, where the, the rabbis said that if a woman has two consecutive sons that bled excessively or died during circumcision, the third son would be exempt. Right? That sounds like hemophilia. Um, the the uh, other description from a little bit later on in the 12th century was a well-known Arabic physician, Albacus, who um, described a family where there were many male members who had bleeding disorders and, and the females appeared to be carriers. Again, sounds very much like hemophilia. And then more recently, from the 18th century in the US, there was a physician by the name of John Conrad Otto who described a family uh, you know, on the East Coast and traced relatives all the way back to a lady who landed with the, with the pilgrims. Um, and it looked like all the male relatives were the ones that were having the bleeding. So this description was there, has been there for a while, but there was no name to this condition. If people were intrigued by it, but nobody could do anything for it. There was no treatment. Didn't even know what caused it. Maybe something in the blood. People thought maybe it was blood vessels. Maybe it was something else, but nobody had any clue as to what it is. So where does the word hemophilia come from? Actually, that was first described by this physician, Hopf, from the University of Zurich in a little um, collection of, of articles that he, he put together, basically almost like a review article, if you will, looking at all the literature in the world about uh, hemophilia. And he coined this term hemophilia for the first time. And the word simply is sort of a compound of two Greek words, hemo, which suggests blood or bleeding, and philia, which, which, which means, um, you know, affection or love. So it's almost a bizarre name that suggests the love of bleeding or people that love to bleed, which is, you know, I think a, a bit odd. But that's the name that, that was coined. And nobody really cared because there was nobody looking at this condition. There was no other people researching it. Nobody else challenged, you know, the name or changed the name or, or anything like that. So the name stuck. And in fact, that's what we call it today. So this was a disease that was described intermittently, but mostly obscure because no treatment, nobody knew what caused it, and that's how it was. Well, things took a change, a fairly dramatic change, right here in the mid-1800s. As you can see, these are publications um, over the decades about hemophilia, and you just see the spike going up here um, in the mid 1800s. Well, there was actually a very good reason for it. And uh, again, going back to some of the historical 
background that, that Dr. Lederer was referring to, the reason why this interest was suddenly peaked was because a very famous and actually a very powerful person turned out to be a hemophilia carrier. That's her right there. That's Queen Victoria, who was the monarch of the British Empire. And she turned out to be a carrier of hemophilia. And through her, here's the, the family tree of Queen Victoria. So what you see in this family tree is basically, you know, the, the round ones are the females, the, the squares are the males. The ones that are solid are the ones that are affected by hemophilia. The ones that are, are open are, are unaffected. So you can see that among many of her children, she had at least two daughters who were carriers, and she had one son, Leopold, who had hemophilia. And he, he died at the age of 31 from an intracranial bleed. But through her carrier daughters, hemophilia spread to multiple royal families of Europe to the Spanish royalty, here to this one over here, to the German royalty, and then through Alexandra, who was the granddaughter of Queen Victoria, went to Russian royalty. And that was another story that is really interesting and really quite a sad chapter in, in Russian history, where the fifth child of this, this uh, family, the royal family, Alexei, was the only male and, and thus the czar apparent, he had hemophilia. And here's the family. This is the, um, the Russian royal family. This is Tsar Nicholas. This is Queen Victoria's granddaughter, Alexandra. These are their daughters. Here's Alexei. Okay. And this boy's hemophilia was severe. And he bled frequently into his joints, into other soft tissues, had a lot of pain. And this became a nightmare for this family because this is a royal family, right? And this, this boy is being groomed to be the next czar. He's supposed to project a macho, you know, strong image. And here the family realizes he's fragile. His mom has seen her uncle uh, die of hemophilia. And, and so they're keeping him all protected and they're struggling with his disease. And the strain that it's putting on them and the family as they're going through all this is is felt by many historians to be one of the factors that actually enabled the Russian Revolution to succeed like it did. But there was another element to this, another interesting twist. There was a guy um, who was uh, almost like sort of a mystic kind of guy, Rasputin, who was the only one who was able to help uh, Alexei. And he would come in, he would do some hypnosis, maybe give him some herbs, we don't know what all he did, but he would calm him down, he would help his pain, and so that gave him unprecedented access to the royal family. And unfortunately, this, this person had a, a bad reputation with the public, and the public could not understand why the royal family is giving this man this much access, because they could not explain to them, this is why we are letting him come and, and, and be, be with the royal family and come in anytime he wants, and so that was another thing that made the public kind of say, well, this royals are they're getting corrupt. Okay. So, so really an interesting twist of history, but this is what uh, made hemophilia, it brought it front and center. This, this little quirk of history where large numbers of people in powerful families in Europe and Russia were affected by it, and that led to an enhanced investigation of the condition and, and some of the things that we learned from there. And so going on from what we knew back when Alexei had this, which is basically close to nothing, we didn't know what caused it, we didn't know how to treat it, we didn't know anything about hemophilia. Let's go on now to see exactly what we have learned since then and what this condition actually is. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides before we jump into the treatment and how that has evolved. So what exactly is hemophilia? So in, in, in the simplest of terms, let's first look at what happens in the normal scenario. So normal hemostasis normally proceeds by way of a couple of phased reactions, right? Although they're happening in a sort of a continuum, but we kind of think of it as phases. There's a primary hemostatic phase, which involves vascular constriction, okay? So sort of almost a mechanical pressure to stop bleeding. And then there's the formation of a platelet plug, 
which happens by the action of von Willebrand factor and various platelet receptors, which cause platelets to come and stick to the, to the, um, to the area that is injured and, and plug it up. Now, if that's, if that's all that happened, this would not stay there very long because this is not just an empty pipe. There's blood flowing on this under sheer force and there's force being applied to this plug. So in order for it to be able to stay there for longer than a few hours, it needs to be strengthened and it needs to be supported. And that support is provided by the formation of fibrin, right, which is done by the action of the coagulation factors. In hemophilia, what happens is that everything proceeds just like normal. If you can see, if you put them side to side, everything proceeds normally until the formation of the platelet plug. But that's where things fall apart. If you don't support this plug, it only lasts for a few hours. Few hours is not enough for the healing of the endothelium. It requires a few days in, in, in most cases, except for the most minor uh, injuries. And so, so in that scenario, what happens then is that in a few hours, even though it looks like nothing happened at the time, the person starts bleeding because this clot starts falling apart. And that's basically what happens in hemophilia. Um, because of this, it's hopefully easy to understand that the bleeding in hemophilia, and we'll see that in, in the clinical context here in a minute, tends to be delayed. So in other words, it expresses itself in a delayed fashion. So for example, if somebody comes in with a trauma within the last few minutes, that person and a normal person, uh, you know, compared to a normal person, a hemophilic would look about the same. But give it a few hours, and the person with hemophilia would have a huge hematoma, maybe even a compartment syndrome, whereas a normal person would not. Okay, So that's what happens with hemophilia. It's delayed bleeding. And the other thing about hemophilia is that the bleeding is deep-seated. It's in joints and soft tissues like muscles and so forth. That's what the bleeding tends to be. Um, so this fibrin, as we know, is, is made by the coagulation cascade. And I promise I'm not going to show you this uh, any more than this one time. Um, but it, it's actually the only thing I want to point out here is that the end game here, the, the goal of this system is to make fibrin to stabilize the clot. And the way the fibrin is generated is by the action of thrombin, which is converted from prothrombin by the action of all these different factors. Without getting into too many details, I just want to point out that these factors here, factor eight and factor nine, are part of what we call as the amplification loop of the coagulation system. And they are very important in, in, um, in an effective generation of thrombin. So once there's a trauma, there's a triggering of this cascade, uh, this system kicks in and starts making more and more uh, activated factor 8 and 9, which, which generates more and more activated factor 10. Small amounts of factor 10 are not going to cut it. You need large amounts when there's a significant hemostatic challenge. And... And that, in turn, generates sufficient thrombin to make the fibrin that is needed to stabilize the clot. Well, what happens in hemophilia, simply, is that there is an absence of either factor 8, which is hemophilia A, which, by the way, is more common. About 80% of patients with hemophilia have that. Or there is absence of factor 9, which is hemophilia B, also called as Christmas disease. That is based on the patient that first had it and that they named it after the patient but now it's called hemophilia B. So these deficiencies happen because of mutations on the X chromosome. Both these genes, the gene for factor eight as well as factor nine, are both located on the X chromosome. And these diseases clinically look indistinguishable. If you did not know that the patient had a deficiency of one or the other, you would not know which one it is. They look exactly the same clinically. Okay. So... Um, so that's, that's what we now know causes hemophilia. How common is it? It's not very common, but about 1 in 5,000 male births are associated with uh, hemophilia. And in the U.S., there's currently the estimates are there's about 20,000 males living with hemophilia. Worldwide, that number is close to about half a million. Okay. And... It occurs everywhere in all races, in all ethnic groups. How do we make a diagnosis? 
of hemophilia. So, obviously, you know, we know it's a familial disease. So, if there's a family history and you know that somebody has family members with hemophilia, you know, it, it, it tends to make it a little bit more easier when somebody presents for the bleeding disorder. But the family history may be negative in many patients. Up to 30% of patients with hemophilia can have a new mutation. So, in fact, that is what was felt to be the case with Queen Victoria, is that she had a new mutation because there was no history of hemophilia before that in the royal families. So family history may or may not be present, but the symptoms, which are very classic, joint bleeds. If you see somebody with recurrent joint bleeds, there's almost nothing that does that other than hemophilia. There's a few other things. Occasionally, you can work that out, but for the most part, that's mostly, mostly hemophilia. And then finally, once you suspect it based on the symptoms, the way you establish and, and, and confirm your diagnosis is by actually checking the factor levels because you need that not only to confirm the diagnosis but to also know which kind of hemophilia it is because that's how you're going to treat the patient. So the factor assays help with making that diagnosis but there's one other thing that the factor assays do which is very important and that is it tells us where these patients fall on the range of severity. And here's what the, the breakdown is. So if somebody has undetectable factor levels, less than 1%, they are called severe. If they have 1% to 5%, they are moderate. And if it's greater than 5 usually 5 to 25 sometimes they'll be a little bit higher than that. But that's mild. Now, what does this mean? Why do we make this classification? Does it mean that if somebody comes to the ER after a car wreck, can we just say if they're mild, we can kind of go easy with them, let them go get uh, x-rays, and then we can deal with them? The answer is absolutely not. That is not the reason for this classification. This classification does not apply to patients who are undergoing a major hemostatic challenge like trauma or surgery, because for that, the levels that are needed for hemostasis are close to 100%. So patients with mild hemophilia will bleed and die just as much as patients with severe hemophilia if they have been in an accident or if they undergo major surgery. So what is the, what is the reason for this? The reason for this classification is to tell us the risk of spontaneous bleeding in these patients. A spontaneous bleed is a bleed that happens without any kind of a triggering event. No trauma, you know, no, nothing that the patient can recall. So it's like somebody just maybe sitting on a chair and they get up to go to get something from the fridge and then notice their knee is swelling up on them. That's a spontaneous bleed. That happens in patients with severe hemophilia anywhere from one to two times a week. Okay, so, so you can think about that, almost five to eight times a month. If you go just from 1% to, to 1 to 5%, that goes to about five to eight times a year. So the, the incidence of severity uh, of spontaneous bleeding drops quite a bit with just a slight increment in factor level. And then if you go to 5% or over, they do not have spontaneous bleeds at all. They only bleed with trauma. So, so this classification helps us to know who are the patients who are at the highest risk that we need to follow closely and that we need to give factor, etc. But keep, keep this in mind because this principle applies to what we're going to talk about in just a minute, which is the, the principle of prophylaxis with factor. And we'll look at that in just a minute. As well as the idea of certain novel therapies like gene therapy. If you think about it, one of the challenges of gene therapy is the expression of sufficient amounts of the, the, the gene product. And here, you don't need a lot of expression to, to change the phenotype of a person from somebody who ble bleeds frequently and has horrible joints to somebody who, you know, behaves like a mild hemophiliac who doesn't bleed frequently. So, so, so this principle is important to understand. Now, Given this, once you have the diagnosis, what are some of the things we look at? What are some of the things we see in patients with hemophilia? I've already kind of alluded to it, but let's kind of look at uh, that a little bit more. So the main problem, as I said, with patients with hemophilia is bleeding into joints. And the most common joints are the hinge joints. So the knees, the elbows, the ankles are the ones that are affected the most. And this is the thing that really destroys these patients' quality of life because this causes pain and swelling. But not only that, once blood gets into the joint, it brings a lot of other stuff in there that's bad. And it starts causing 
an inflammatory reaction, much like, almost like rheumatoid arthritis, with the formation of a panis-like uh, synovitis, which destroys cartilage. And this is sort of a summary of, of research done by, by various groups over, over a long period of time that, that found some of the things that happen at a molecular level in these patients, uh, in their joints. You have increased in inflammatory cytokines. You have expression of proliferative genes, uh, which causes the synovial hypertrophy and destruction of the cartilage. So all of this then is what causes this progressive joint damage. And what happens is once a joint is damaged, it is more prone to bleeding again. And so it sets up a vicious cycle. And that's what causes these patients' joints to be destroyed. Many times, by the time they're in their early teens or at the most early 20s, these patients need a new joint. That's how bad it, it gets with this, uh, with the severe hemophiliacs. And the, the pattern that you see is, is sort of summarized here, where it starts out with a bleed, and the patient obviously has swelling and pain, and then it starts causing cartilage damage, and once that becomes established, the patient has restriction in their joint mobility, and obviously that causes muscle weakness, muscle wasting, and, and they end up with joints that are basically looks, look like look worse than 90-year-old patients' joints. And this person is probably a teenager or in the early 20s, and their joints are totally destroyed. So this is what these patients have been dealing with as a big, big problem. Now, can they bleed in, in other places? Absolutely. They can bleed in other soft tissue areas, and they can also have potentially limb and life-threatening uh, bleeds, such as a patient here that has a muscular bleed, potentially putting them at risk for things like compartment syndrome and so on. So you can see why this was such... Imagine having this kind of situation in the days of Alexi when there was no treatment. You didn't even know what, why this was happening. And there was nothing you could do for it. I mean, this, these patients had a horrible life, which is why many physicians just kind of ignored it and just said, oh, well, you know, we'll just treat them com comfort care and just, just move on. Um... One other thing that used to be and, and still is a significant problem is uh, intracranial bleeding. Back in the early days uh, when we did not have good products uh, for treating these patients, the mortality in this, with this was um, 70%. And this is even during the time where we had blood and plasma, even then the mortality was close to 7%. It is still around 20%. But the incidence now is much lower. It's about 2 or 3%. Back then, the, the cause of death in about, about a third of the patients with hemophilia died from intracranial bleeds back before we had better treatments. So, um, you know, this was a considerable problem even in the 40s and 50s when we actually found that there was a protein in the blood. They called it anti hemophilia globulin, because there was no other name. They didn't know what, what it was exactly. Um, because factor eight was described later on. And so they said, well, it's in the plasma. So we know it's in the plasma. So if you give people blood and if you give them plasma, then we can treat this. Problem with that was that blood transfusions are not easy. Giving whole blood, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. And it has other problems and complications. Number two, if somebody has zero factor eight, you're going to need three or four liters of plasma to get them up to a level that is anywhere halfway decent to treat a bleed like this, okay? So because of that, in spite of getting plasma, I mean, they would have to go to the hospital, they would have to get started with plasma and get liters and liters of plasma just for one bleed. And by the time they got done with it and they got, you know, equivalent to what you would call today as one dose of factor, uh, their bleed had already expanded, the damage to the tissues, joints, any, anywhere else was already done maybe it helped them to survive and, uh, and then end up with joints like we just, we just saw. So this is what the situation was until the 60s. Well, there was, uh, again, a serendipitous uh, um, twist in the 60s where Dr. Judith Graham Poole discovered cryoprecipitate. And she found it kind of, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a strange way that she, uh, she had some uh, plasma that she had frozen and then I think her electricity went out and it had thawed out and there was this junky looking dirty material at the bottom which she thought is something that you know we, 
probably should throw it away. It's probably fungus or something. We said, let's examine this. Let's see what it is. So she analyzed it, and it turns out that it was a highly concentrated form that had these factors right here. Factor 8, 1 millibrand, fibrinogen, and factor 13. Highly concentrated. And so, so this really was a, a fairly significant advance for hemophilia back then. Hemophilia A, not, not B. Um, because hemophilia B is factor 9, and you don't have factor 9 in, in, in uh, cryo. But um, for hemophilia A patients, they could now get a fairly decent dose with a much smaller volume. And, and that became a significant improvement in their quality of life. There were even home health people that could go out and infuse them at home because it was a smaller volume. And, and that um, you know, started looking like a favorable, positive thing. And things got even better when companies figured out, by then in the 60s, factors were described. We knew what factor 8 was, what factor 9 was. The coagulation cascade was published in Nature. You know, and, and um, so we knew a lot of those things. And the companies, pharmaceutical companies, figured out ways to extract factor from plasma. So they would run the, the, the plasma. They would have basically antibodies and other, uh, you know, uh, peptides to pick up the molecule of interest. And so they could pick up factor 8 or factor 9. And then, you know, they would concentrate that, wash it out into a, into a container, and then have a highly concentrated form of factor where, in a while, you could give a person a dose of that factor, which would require previously four to five liters of plasma to give. Okay, so this is a great advance. This now moved patient's care to not only from the ER to home, it actually moved it to basically, you know, where they could do it themselves. Many of them started learning how to self-infuse, how to give themselves factor, and was a great time uh, in, uh, in hemophilia. I think a lot of optimism uh, that, was, uh, that was there. But one of the things that was happening at this, at this time, remember this is the late 60s, early 70s, was that there was a disaster brewing in the, in the blood bank system, and that was HIV and hepatitis C. Nobody knew what HIV was. Nobody knew what hepatitis C was. They used to call it non-A, non-B. And the blood banks were not really checking for any of this. They didn't know about what to check for. And just to give you an idea, in order to make one of these vials, plasma would be pooled in these large centrifuges. And how big they are, it gives you, you know, this is a man standing here, adult man. And these centrifuges are huge. These, these, uh, uh, Containers have plasma from thousands of donors, and you take a lot from that, and that one lot, one vial, has contributions from, literally from thousands of donors. And so a severe hemophiliac who bleeds a couple times a week was taking two or three doses, maybe even more, a month, okay? Even if they're taking on-demand, forget about prophylaxis, okay? They were taking, they were being exposed to large amounts of, of, uh, of this uh, of plasma. And so not surprisingly, the hemophilia population is the one that really came down with uh, these viral infections. Over 50% of hemophiliacs got HIV and over 90% got hepatitis C. This really devastated this whole population. And if there's a face we could put to this, um, especially in this country, uh, this is it. Ryan White. Uh, people that are here from, I think many of you all may recognize this name, but people that are here from ID, uh, I'm sure, are familiar with the Ryan White Act, which was uh, initially uh, enacted by Congress in 1990, um, uh, named after Ryan White, uh, for people, for supporting people living with HIV AIDS in the U.S. Ryan White was a hemophiliac who got HIV from a, a tainted uh, factor unit, factor uh, vial, and he was living at a time where scientists and medical professionals started learning a lot about HIV, but we didn't have good treatments yet. And, uh, but the community, the education in the community was very poor. So he went through hell, literally, because the school would not let him come because they thought that, you know, any kind of contact would cause HIV. And, you know, he went, he had to basically move, his parents had to move from where they lived. They lived in uh, Kokomo, Indiana, and they had to move to another city to, to actually be able to let him go to school. Um, and, but because of all his experiences, a lot of this became very public, what he was going through. 
the battles that he was going through with the schools. So he, he had a lot of celebrities that came, you know, and, and you know, uh, got, him, got him on their shows. He met with President Reagan and, and um, was a big advocate for the education about HIV. And that's, that's what uh, uh, the Wine White Act comes from. But this was obviously a major disaster in this, in this uh, community, and it really changed the blood bank and how they do business. But also, it drove the, the, uh, the research even more to try to find alternatives to plasma-derived products. And, and in the early 90s, actually in 1994, the first recombinant factor eight product, Recombinate, was approved. And that is now the predominant way that we, we uh, get factor. It's mostly recombinant. And here's just a, a simple uh, representation of how this uh, how these products are made. On the left side, you see the plasma products. I already showed you how that is done. You spin down the cells, you get rid of the cells, and you purify the factor of interest, and you package it into, you know, into vials, and, and they're ready to go. The recombinant products, on the other hand, there's no plasma involved. They're uh, bioengineered cells. Chinese hamster ovary cells are the ones that are used most commonly. And the, the, there's a vector that is put in here, which contains the gene of interest, which is factor eight or nine. And that those cells are grown in, in the culture medium, which has fetal calf serum to grow it. And once the factor is produced by the gene that is in those cells, that factor is then pulled out like you do would do with, it, with the same techniques that are used here. And you get pure factor eight that is then stabilized in human albumin. That's the first generation product. This population of patients was so averse to any kind of animal product that gradually now we have come to a third generation recombinant product where there's no fetal calf serum in this. It's plant protein medium that is used to grow these cells. And in the final product, it's actually basically just, uh, you know, sucrose. Uh, there's no albumin in that. So they have wanted to get rid of as much animal protein as they possibly can, just because it's almost like PTSD. It's almost like a collective PTSD that this, this community has had with what happened in the 70s and 80s with HIV and hepatitis C. They're very, very gun shy of unknown things floating around in the, in the uh, blood uh, system. By the way, just as a side note, since the um, 1970s and 80s, there has not yet been a, a recorded uh, incidence of some kind of infectious transmission with a uh, plasma-derived product. And in other parts of the world, this is still used quite a bit. But in most developed countries, we are using a lot more uh, recombinant products. So this is how the, the products have come. So we have come a long way from having nothing to using plasma and, uh, you know, um, just uh, trying to get uh, large volumes of, of, uh, of uh, plasma into patients to now having not only packaged concentrated factor, but, but uh, having factor that is safe. And so we've come a long way from the days of Alexi and also from the days of Ryan White. Okay, so there's safe and effective products that, that are available now. So how are we doing? How is the current man? How are we using these products? So there's a couple of things I want to, to point out here. One is for everybody here that may see these patients in any situation, right? This is the acute setting. When somebody comes in, they're having a bleed or they're having some other problems. The main thing to keep in mind is, first of all, don't do any harm. Don't give them things that are going to cause them problems. Um, this may seem obvious, but this is the things that have actually been done to hemophilia patients, which is why... It's a statement that needs to be made. The other important thing is that if a hemophiliac comes in and tells you that they're having a bleed, even if you don't see anything on clinical exam, believe them because they can actually feel the bleed when, even when it's very, very preclinical and very small. There have been instances where patients have come in complaining of having a bleed in their thigh or somewhere, and the emergency room physician checked, uh, did a clinical exam, didn't find any bruising, didn't find any change in the, in the girth of their, their leg, and sent them home only for the patient to come back a few hours later with a very swollen leg and having compartment syndrome. Okay. So listening to the patient is very important uh, because they know when they're bleeding. And then this is really common sense that if a patient with hemophilia comes in with anything, and if you're needing to do a workup or do imaging, anything else, uh, make sure you get them up to a safe level of factor. And if, when, when unsure, get them up to 100%. Now, of course, for that, you need to know what kind of hemophilia they have, whether it's A or B. But that's the thing that uh, uh, is the bottom line is that you don't want to start doing stuff until you make sure that they're safe from the standpoint of their, of their bleeding disorder. Uh, 
Now, this is what we do in the acute setting. What about managing these patients through all their life? Because remember, these people, I just showed you what happens to them. They have recurrent joint bleeds, especially when they're severe, and even some moderates. And they have, they're at risk for other severe bleeds, including soft tissue and intracranial bleeds. So what can we do to, um, to manage these patients <coughs> lifelong? So there's two strategies. And, and one of them is what is used, has been used for a long time, and it's probably still used in most countries, is what we call as on-demand treatment, right? And that is simply that the patient feels the bleed coming on, they're trained to immediately get IV access, they can usually do it themselves. Most severe hemophiliacs, by the way, have learned to self-infuse. They can start their own IV and they can infuse themselves. But then what we, what we have realized is that prophylaxis, meaning using factor concentrates to prevent bleeding, um, is actually a better way of doing this. And the idea here, again, is that if you get somebody's level from even less than 1% to even 1% or 2%, you change their phenotype. They are no longer going to bleed weekly or you know, even a couple of times a month. Their bleeding rate may go down to a few times a year. So just a little bump in that will change, may have a big change, big impact on their, uh, on their bleeding tendency. And if you stop joint bleeds, you stop one of the biggest morbidities in these patients. And by the way, prophylaxis has also been shown to reduce the incidence of intracranial bleeds, which is particularly horrible uh, in patients uh, or in pediatric age groups. Because not only is it immediate risk in the acute setting, it becomes a, a, a risk of chronic problems because of psychomotor uh, retardation that happens in the, in the pediatric age group. So, so this has actually been studied now, and uh, I don't want to go into the details of this because we don't have time to do that here, but if anybody is interested, here's a paper that was published uh, over 10 years ago now um, comparing aggressive on-demand therapy with prophylaxis in young boys, and this was a pediatric study, and what they found was that even very aggressive prophylaxis, when they measured the joints with MRIs after about uh, three or four years, 50% uh, uh, of the patients had already got joint damage with that. But the ones that weren't prophylaxis, only about 7% or so had joint damage. Okay, so, so clearly this is the, the, the way to go, and this is increasingly becoming the standard in most countries, most developed countries anyway. Uh, it's not cheap. The cost, the cost difference between on-demand and prophylaxis is about four to five-fold. So it is much more expensive, but in the long run, it translates into a much better quality of life for these patients. So because of these advances, the lifespan of patients with hemophilia now, and this is some data from the, from the CDC, um, is that it has now, especially since the, in the 2000s and beyond, is actually come pretty much close to the normal, average normal population. And so that's a great thing. That's a success for us in terms of our treatment. It does bring up some additional challenges, which we have to, we have to deal with, but but this is, this is a, a, an achievement compared to where things were in the early 1900s, in um, uh, the days of Alexei, where we had no treatments and most patients died in their teenage years. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that even though this looks great, right now this is only about a third of the, of the patients uh, of the world um, in, in the developed countries the majority of hemophiliacs are still living in this area right here because they don't have access to this. It's very expensive. Okay. So, so that's still a problem globally, but people that live in developed world hemophiliacs, their lifespan is close to, to the normal lifespan. Um, the other thing that has really evolved, especially since the 60s, 70s, is the, is the, is the um, uh, hemophilia treatment centers which are centers of excellence that have a multimodal uh, um, group of providers that work together to provide the best possible care, both in terms of medical, social, you know, physical therapy, and other things like that. Um, it's called the Hemophilia Treatment Center, HTC. And these are federally supported centers. There's about 140 of these in the U.S. Uh, right now. And one, our center is one of them. And there was a study published in Blood in uh, 2000 that actually compared the outcomes of hemophilia patients treated at HTCs 
versus non-HTC settings in the community. And it actually showed not only improved outcomes in terms of their quality of life and other medical outcomes, but actually an improvement in survival um, in, in, that, in that study. So, so the majority of patients with hemophilia now in the U.S. are treated at HTCs. So in closing, I'm going to um, just pause for a minute and say, well, let's look at where we have been. You know, we have come from just 100 years. Alexei that I told you about was 100 years ago. And by the way, he didn't die of hemophilia. He died actually 100 years ago. It'll be 100 years in July. In, in 1918, that entire family was assassinated, executed on the same day by the Bolsheviks. Okay? That's how Alexei died. But we have come a long way from that time to now where patients are living pretty much a normal lifespan. They have products that are safe, that are effective, that are easy to use. They have small volumes now. They have products where you can get the whole volume in two or three cc's, and you can infuse that. So where can we go from here? Are there any issues? I mean, can it get any better than this? Yeah, the answer is uh, there's always room for improvement. And here's some things that I think are still issues that we need to, to work on. One is that even though things are, are good and prophylaxis really works and it improves these patients' qualities of life like night and day, but it is clearly a challenge. Think about having to do IV infusions on yourself two or three times a day, two or three times a week. I mean, that is not an easy thing, especially even if you're not having a problem. That's what prophylaxis is, is, is the idea is to not have problems. If you're feeling fine, you have to then be disciplined enough to go there get the IV kit out, start an IV on yourself, infuse yourself, and do this three times a week. Not an easy thing to do. Creates a significant burden. There have been a lot of studies that, that kind of study this, the burden on patients and families and doing this kind of thing. Um, and that is one of the reasons why the compliance and the adherence to this is not 100%. And many people uh, don't do it regularly, and that's when they have breakthrough problems. They have, they have bad joints because even though they are technically on prophylaxis, but they don't do it regularly. Not a surprise to anybody here, right? I mean, people are non-compliant at times, even with oral medications, and much less you know, think about giving themselves IV for the rest of their life, three or four times a week. So we need something that is, is a little bit better, that somehow is able to ease the burden of this. And, and uh, I'll show you some ideas that, that have been looked at on that. Um, we're not going to go into much detail in this, because this is a, a whole day symposium here, but... Um, Patients with hemophilia, about 30% in uh, factor 8 uh, and about uh, 3 to 5% in factor 9 can develop antibodies against the infused factor. Usually not a problem in adult patients. Uh, this is seen predominantly in pediatrics. By the time they come to us, the peds people usually have done a good job of tolerizing them. They put them through these various regimens, you know, this uh, immune tolerization regimens, and the vast majority of them are tolerized by the time they come to us. So not a big problem in the adults, but a significant problem in the children, which we are still kind of battling with because the regular factor products don't work in these patients. You have to use the so-called bypassing agents where you basically bypass factor 8 and 9 and you pour things into the common pathway. So you activate thrombin through things like, uh, you know, high dose recombinant factor 7 or a product called FIBA, which basically dumps thrombin directly into the blood. Okay, so, so those are the so-called bypassing agents. Not great agents, can't measure them, don't know how to measure their activity, uh, except clinical response. So, so this is still an area of a lot of uh, you know, challenges that are being dealt with. Fortunately, not as much of a problem by the time they get to the adult setting. And another area that is increasingly becoming an issue uh, is as these patients live longer and longer, we are seeing that... Uh, they're coming up with patients with, with conditions that we don't we didn't see in hemophilia earlier because they, most of them died in their teens and 20s and maybe 30s and 40s. So now we're starting to see patients live up to 60s, maybe even 70s and older. And we're starting to see some things that we didn't see in hemophilia before. And we have next to almost no data as to how to manage them in hemophilia patients. The problem is that the numbers are small. It's difficult to do randomized trials. But what we have is databases that are trying to at least answer this question in a, in a rational way. Um, we have expert opinions based on people that deal with large numbers of patients, have access to large databases, and that's all we have right now. So that's 
some of the challenges we are working on. A good problem to have, but something that we do need to, to work on. So the only, th only thing I'm going to focus on in the next uh, about five minutes is to tell you about what we are doing about this. Because this is something we can still work on. So here's what we have done. Said they have to give this product IV, right? People try to say we can make it simpler if we can make it sub-Q. That would be great. If you don't have to start IV lines, just give it subcutaneously. Well, they've tried every which way they could. Companies have even made like, you know, foams and certain polymers and tried to insert them like a, like a depot and, uh, and try to do it. Doesn't work. Uh, factor 8 and factor 9 are not bioavailable to any uh, medically significant degree uh, through subcutaneous route. You have to give it IV. So then if that's what we are stuck with, so then the next question is, can we do something to the molecules to make them last a little bit longer so that, yeah, they got to start an IV, but maybe they don't have to do it three or two or three times a week. Maybe they can do it less frequently, right? So that's what was the next step. And these products are actually on the market now. I don't want you to, to look too much at this side here, okay, because this is just different molecules and showing what has been done to the factor eight. They've used pegylation and, you know, uh, a variety of other uh, manipulations with the molecule to make it last longer. And as you can see here, what is shown on this side is what I want you to focus on is that this is the half-life increment compared to native normal factor eight. It's not a great uh, uh, benefit here that you can see. It's only about one and a half hours, uh, one and a half times uh, improvement. So going from about eight to 12 hours to about 14 to 18 hours, that's it. So it goes from three times a week to twice a week. Not exactly a home run. And so, so this has not worked very well for factor eight, which is really the majority of hemophilia patients. But we have these products out there. It's being used by some patients. But it has worked. This, this approach of modifying the molecule to last longer has worked a lot better with factor nine, which already has a longer half-life. This half-life is about 18 to 24 hours. And when you multiply that, it goes to, to days. And there are people with, with hemophilia B who can now dose once every two weeks even with these factors. So, so this has made at least some of quality of life benefit in some of these patients, but they still have to use IVs. So can we get any better than that? Can we get to anything else? And the answer is yes. There is an attempt to, to do just that by developing treatments that are not factor at all. So the way you get subcutaneous dosing is you have to find something other than the regular factor eight and nine, because those don't go through the subcutaneous route. And I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but let me just point out that uh, this antibody, bispecific antibody, it's, it's a very interestingly mole designed molecule. It's called emicizumab. It has the two FC portions, uh, the two FAP portions actually uh, uh, target two different antigens. One targets factor nine and the other one targets factor 10. So if you think about factor eight, what does factor eight do? It's a cofactor for factor nine to activate factor 10. So factor eight brings factor nine and 10 together and makes them makes factor 10 to get activated. Well, what this antibody does is that it, it grabs factor nine on, on with one hand and it grabs factor 10 with the other hand and it brings them together. And so it's, it's basically working like factor eight. It's a very, very smartly designed molecule. It's a factor eight mimetic. And it works great by subcutaneous route. You can give it once a week. And it's actually approved right now and it works very well uh, in patients. These two here are doing something very interesting and that is to knock down the, um, uh, the anticoagulant part of the, of the normal blood system. So think about this, knocking down antithrombin levels. This is an interfering RNA uh, called Pitusaran that has knocked down antithrombin levels to very low level, less than 20%, which if we think of that, we think of that almost as risky, right? That's the kind of thing that would cause patients to maybe have thrombotic events. But what the rationale for this was that they observed some patients with severe hemophilia who did not bleed, even though they had levels that looked like they were in the severe hemophilic range, their bleeding pattern was not. And so they, they felt maybe there's something else in these patients. And some of those patients were found to have procoagulant mutations, like factor V Leiden and so forth. And so because of that, they tried this idea to say, well, you know, it's an imbalance in the system, right? So 
if people have two, if they have a missing coagulation protein, then there's an imbalance where there's more anticoagulants and less coagulant. And then if there's a normal coagulant, but a missing anticoagulant, then you have an imbalance there, and that's a prothrombotic situation. But if you have a low anticoagulant, uh, a low uh, procoagulant like factor eight, and you reduce the anticoagulant as well, now you get a balance. And, and that balance may allow the patient to not bleed. And it, interestingly, it's been working in some of the early clinical trials. Now, still very early. We still have to see how things pan out with this. But this is now a, a molecule that, again, can be used either once a week. There's even studies that are looking at using it once a month. It has a very long half-life. So, so all these strategies are potentially coming where these patients might be able to go to not just IV infusions every two or three uh, times a week, but, but a subcutaneous infusion once a week or maybe even once a month. So that's, that's great. But finally, last but not the least, um, there is now significant advance going on in the area of gene therapy for hemophilia. And this is simply the concept of, you know, how we make the products, the factor eight or nine in the lab, you know, in those Chinese hamster ovary cells. Well, we can take the gene and if we can deliver it to the cells in the patient's body, they can make the product and just put out straight into the body, right? Makes a lot of sense. And it's a, it's a disease where all you need is a little bit of expression to get, to get benefit. But, um, this has been a big challenge, and without going into the details, uh, you know, there was lots of ups and downs, uh, technical challenges with the vectors, how to package things, but more recently, within the last 10 years or so, we've had some really exciting um, developments in the area of gene therapy, both with hemophilia A and hemophilia B. Hemophilia A was a bigger challenge because factor A is a much larger gene, much larger molecule, and it was harder to package in the, in the vectors. But, but this one company um, uh, has developed a, a product which is now being studied, uh, gene therapies, Biomarin, um, it's a B-domain deleted uh, product. And the expressions, it's a small study presented initially at the World Federal uh, World Hemophilia Center, uh, meeting in 2016, where you can see that expression of factor eight is greater than 50% in the majority of patients. Some of them even going up to normal levels, even supranormal levels. And this follow-up now is updated. And as you can see here, what you're seeing here is about seven patients still. And this gray zone here is the factor levels on the y-axis. And you see 60%, 150%. And you, as you can see, over time, most of the patients are staying in this really, really good range where they definitely have no risk of spontaneous bleeding. But even with the risk of traumatic bleeding is dramatically reduced uh, in patients. They're almost, some of them are pretty much at normal levels. So this is very exciting right now. There's similar results have been seen with a factor um, nine, although not to this level. It was um, close to 30% or so in that, in that study. But it remains to be seen how long this will last, whether this expression will remain for how many years, we'll see. And, and then whether this is something that can be redone. Uh, which is a big challenge right now because if you treat them one time with that vector, once that expression is gone, you can't retreat them again because the immune system will not let you. They develop antibodies that are too high for retreatment. So there are lots of hurdles and challenges still, but I think this is an exciting time where not only are we preventing bleeds and keeping things safe for the patients, we are potentially getting to the point where now we can even start thinking about making things even more convenient for these patients in terms of subcutaneous therapies and possibly even something like gene therapy, which people are throwing out the word cure, I would use that with very, very, you know, I would, I would put a lot of caution on that. I don't think we can use the word cure yet with this, but it is probably the step that is the closest to that. So with that, I will, I will close and, uh, you know, hopefully there's time for a couple of questions. Thank you. That was absolutely splendid. Um, I just have uh, one question to start yeah. things off. From what you've described, I would guess that the female carriers have no phenotype. Is that correct or is there anything? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. So the female carriers, for the most part, don't bleed because most of them have at least 50 to 60 percent. You would think that that's what they would have. But there are female carriers who can actually have levels that are close to mild hemophilia. The reason for that being um, lionization because um, the females that are carriers, they have one X that is normal and one X that is mutated. 
But uh, in, the, in the somatic cells, there's a random inactivation of one X, supposed to be random. And if the majority of inactivated X chromosomes are the, the mutated ones, then she'll have almost close to a normal level, close to 100%. But if the majority are, are the normal Xs, then the ones that are active are the, are the mutated ones. And those carriers can actually have levels that are in the mild hemophilic range. That's a great question because we sometimes hear about carriers who have been treated improperly because of the wrong impression that they don't bleed. And that's not true. Carriers can bleed because their levels can be in the range of mild hemophilia at times. Okay, great. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Following up on Dr. Mothers, do you ever see a female child from you know, parents, so now have on both exodial. Do they ever survive? <laughs> Female child, yeah. So it's it's rare, but it it yeah it can happen. So if it's a, a hemophilic father and a carrier mother, you could theoretically have a female hemophiliac. It's been reported. Yes, they do have much more severe bleeding, but now with the availability of prophylactic factors, they can usually make it through men, menstruation and childbirth and all that. But previously, in the olden times, absolutely, those those patients usually died at, after menarche. Shortly after menarche, okay. but but now but now they they childhood though. yes childhood oh yeah right from year one they're just they're just that fancy yeah no so so for, in terms of males and females there's not going to be much of, of a difference there in terms of uh, you know the severity uh, of the, the joint bleeds it's going to be the same because the males have no uh, they only have one X and that's that's gone so so the severity is going to be the same. The problem with females comes in during menstruation and childbirth. So during the, the pediatric age, age groups, in developed countries, it's a, it's a standard of care now to use prophylaxis for all severe hemophiliacs. So if somebody has severe hemophilia, he or she will be on prophylaxis. And that should prevent joint bleeds. And then when she gets to menarche, she'll probably have to use a little extra factor during her period and during you know, childbirth and things like that. But it's, now it's not a problem because of the new factors. Yes. Uh, just thinking of the clinical scenario, say like a patient with hemophilia uh, who has safety of spontaneous sleep uh, has received uh, factors uh, in the past. Now the next two days are like say with a pulmonary embolism or a SKI case and now. Like is there anything specifically as a symptomless we should be cautious with before we start with so, like sleep and or any next yeah, yeah. So that's again, that is that is the conundrum we deal with, right? When we, there's no great answers to that, but I'll tell you what the expert opinion is on that. Okay, so so what you want to do there is in the acute setting, you want to get their factor level to 100% or greater, and then you do whatever you need to do. If you need to give them heparin, if you need to give them, you know, thrombolytic therapy, just make sure their factor level is 100%. So so you have to have a good lab that can turn around stat factor levels, and if you're not sure what the level is, dose it to get get it up to 100%. And beyond that, the, the challenge, that's actually not that hard because you can do it in the short term in a few days. The challenge is what about the long term over years when they have to take you know, aspirin or, or some kind of anticoagulant, what do you do then? And, and that's where the data is not that helpful. But in general, the recommendation is that if somebody is on therapeutic anticoagulation, you want their factor levels to be around 30 to 40%. And so they cannot do every other day. They have to do almost daily infusions of factor. Uh, maybe some of these newer agents, which have, you know, or maybe gene therapy and things like that will help patients like this to maintain higher factor levels. But that's all you can do. We had a patient similar to what you described who had a PE. And he took, he took um, uh, anticoagulation for six months. And he was on factor every day during that time. And he was kept at around 40, 30 to 40%. And he did okay with that. He did not bleed. So, but that's all we have right now is just, Limited data, expert opinion, but that's the recommendation at the present time. Just curious to know, like, how much time does it take for the factor levels? When you order it for the lab, if you order it stat, the lab should get it back to you within one to two hours at the most. But you should order it stat because if you don't order it stat, they will send it to a routine channel, and that takes you know a couple of days probably. So make sure you order those levels stat. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you.